Hello everyone, welcome to The Wild Side. This is your host, Kaylin Kite, and that was Brandi Carlisle with The Sound of Silence. And on this week's show, I want to do a bit of recycling of a topic that I recently talked about at an event called Science in the Square. And you might have heard of this. This is an event that was hosted by the University of Exeter's Penryn campus down in Event Square during Falmouth Week. And basically we had a big marquee full of uh, scientific activities that kids could participate in so that they could understand what it's like to be a scientist and what sorts of things we study up on our campus. And I was one of four speakers who got to talk about uh, their area of expertise and I was asked to talk about sound. And some of you who have been listening to this show from the beginning might remember that way at the very beginning of my show a couple years ago, I did a couple of shows where I discussed uh, bird communication and animal communication in general and throughout the years I've talked about kind of the effects of anthropogenic sound and other anthropogenic disturbances on avian and animal communication. But I don't think I've really done that in a general way for a very long time and so I thought this might be a nice point to revisit that topic and kind of revamp the talk that I gave which was aimed at kind of you know children who are around 10 years old or so and think about it from an adult's perspective and think about the sorts of things uh, that I could explain to you guys so that you can maybe get a little bit more out of any nature observations that you make and maybe you can pass some information on uh, to your kids and to your friends if you think that it's interesting. So I was talking about specifically uh, kind of strange sounds and interesting sounds and basically I made my talk into a countdown of the top 10 most interesting and unusual sounds that birds make. And the reason I picked a top 10 list was because the Penryn campus and the Truro campus of the University of Exeter are celebrating their 10 year anniversary this year. And so all of us wanted to do top 10 lists in order to kind of count down uh, in the spirit of this birthday celebration, if you like. But before I dive into that list, I want to give a little bit of background so that you have some context to understand uh, why sound is interesting and the different sorts of sounds that I will have included uh, on my list today. So the first thing is to really think about a definition of what sound is. And as one of the audience members, uh, quite a young audience member, very accurately pointed out, sounds are just wavelengths. And basically sounds are vibrations, and those are wavelengths that are traveling through molecules in the air, or in the soil, or in the water, basically any medium uh, where they can move the molecules against each other. And then that movement is eventually picked up by some sort of specialized body part that is possessed by the animal in question. Now, of course, when we're talking about humans, those body parts are ears. Uh, but in other species, there might be other specialized body parts as well. So, for example, elephants, which are able to hear really uh, deep-pitched noises that are quite far away, so kind of uh, sonic rumblings, basically, kind of on the scale of earthquake-like sounds they can pick up that noise through their feet. They have little fatty foot pads between their toes. And these can pick up the vibrations that come through the soil, and that basically transmits to them as a sound. They are hearing that even though they're detecting it with their feet. Other animals that are in the water have structures that allow them to pick up on the vibrations that travel through the water. So for example, there are a lot of fish that have a bladder-like structure that not only allows them to produce their own sounds, but also to detect some of the vibrations that are coming in from outside. And there are insects that have various types of hearing implements, and one really interesting one is the cockroach, which has the ability to hear through its legs, basically behind its knees. It has little, what we would refer to as ears, that are able to pick up on the vibrations that are coming through the air. So there are all sorts of different specialized body structures, and some of them are quite like our ears, some of them are quite different. Another example that one of the children in my uh, session brought up was the fact that owls have those little panels on their faces sometimes. So if you think about a barn owl that has those kind of two angled um, face components that together make up the left and right side of its face. Each of those very sheer aspects of its face actually are they're quite good at collecting sound and then filtering that into the ears. And you've got other owls that have kind of tufty bits that might pick up on vibrations and help filter that movement into the internal ear in order to allow them to hear a bit better. So there are all sorts of things that allow these organisms like us that rely on 
uh, noises to communicate and to experience the world to understand what is out there, what's making noise, and what are the various qualities of those noises. And that actually is the next thing that I want to mention, which is the fact that sounds have lots of different traits that can be interesting and useful and helpful in terms of interpreting what they mean and where they're coming from and how an organism should respond to them. And I guess you could think about all sorts of different traits to focus on, but the three that I think are really kind of the most fundamental and the easiest to measure are pitch, volume, and timing. And pitch is what we would refer to also as frequency, so whether it's really uh, high up on the spectrum or whether it's really down low. So if it's something um, that's quite small, that tends to be high pitched, you know, like the uh, buzzing of a mosquito, that's quite high pitched and whiny, whereas something that's much lower, uh, for example, maybe a giant bass drum or a, a cello, for example, those have uh, much longer wavelengths and so those are much lower down when we perceive them. The higher, the higher pitch ones having uh, shorter wavelengths that repeat more frequently. So pitch is a really important trait and as you've uh, no doubt noticed from the way I just described that, those are quite useful for hearing, uh, for determining the sound, uh, the size, sorry, of the thing that you're hearing. Now the next important thing is volume and of course volume uh, you can also refer to as amplitude and that's how loud something is. And volume is quite useful for getting an idea of sound size also, so whether something is quite large or quite small, big things tend to make a bit more noise, small things tend to be a bit quieter, although that's not always true, but that is sometimes a useful rule of thumb. But on top of that, you might also get an idea of whether something is far away or nearby. Now again, you might have something that's far off and quite loud that's about the same volume as something that's nearby and quiet. But uh, it can be kind of a useful thing if you're just, you know, that's the only thing you've got. You can kind of have a bit of experience that allows you to figure out whether that's something that's likely at a great distance or a nearby distance. And especially when something is moving, then you can compare the earlier sound to the later sound and that allows you to kind of triangulate and determine whether something is coming closer or moving farther away. So volume again is something that's quite useful for allowing you to determine multiple characteristics of a noise and uh, where it's originating from. And the final thing that I think is quite important for uh, characterizing a sound is the timing of it. When is it occurring? How long is it lasting? What's the rhythm? How, how frequently is it being produced? And those have those sorts of um, sub-components of timing. Those have different names depending on the system that you're talking about them in. So in humans, we tend to refer to things as you know, letters and words and sentences and paragraphs and we kind of uh, arrange them all according to the language that we speak. When we think about animals like birds, we might call them notes and phrases and uh, repetition, and that all indicates that we're kind of thinking of them in a bit more of a musical style and how they fit together as though they were almost uh, a song that humans would write, not just a song that birds would sing. We have different names for these sorts of things, but basically they're just telling us how frequently is a sound being produced and is there any repetition, and if so, how much is there. Now, all three of these things have different combinations depending on what type of sound we're talking about. So the pitch, volume, and timing of my voice, for example, are all quite different than those three characteristics of uh, a horn from a boat that's out in the harbor or from the siren of a police vehicle that's driving past and everything has different combinations of those factors and we learn those as we experience them in life and that's what allows us to respond appropriately and because we learn to them because our um, our understanding of them is not necessarily innate then we do take some time to figure out how to respond accordingly and that's why sometimes if humans were to build a road, for example, in the middle of nowhere, then the sound of cars approaching and maybe the sound of a car horn or any other sort of car noise along that road is not going to make the animals respond necessarily in the way that we would like. So we might want them to get out of the way so that we don't accidentally hit them with the car, but they don't necessarily know yet that those uh, traits, that amplitude, that pitch, and that 
frequency of uh, production of noise, the timing of it, they don't realize that all those things together indicate some sort of approaching danger. And it only is over time, whether it's within an animal's life or kind of evolutionary time within a species' life, um, it's only with that time and experience that the learning is really able to sink in and allow animals to respond appropriately, if indeed they ever do. And there are lots of evolutionary reasons why they should, but there are also some that are that dictates that maybe these animals might never quite respond in the way that we would anticipate for various reasons. There might be some constraints, for example, on their morphology that prevent them from picking up and detecting these sorts of differences that allow them to notice a sound and respond in the right way. But basically, uh, for the most part, you can kind of assume that if an animal has the basic kind of uh, morphological structures to pick up noises, and if those noises are quite important and uh, are going to influence the survival and reproductive capabilities of an organism, then eventually over time that animal will figure out what those sounds mean and maybe even will develop the ability to detect those sounds and respond appropriately if they weren't already able to do so. Now our environments of course are filled with sounds. I've been alluding to this all along and I have categorized these in three basic ways and again this is the sort of thing that you could argue about, but I've just used these three basic categories to make it easier to talk about today. The first category is biotic sounds, which are the sounds of living things, which you might have guessed because bio, of course, indicates life. And these are the sounds that are produced by uh, birds, by frogs, by crickets, by whatever is out there making noise uh, that's alive. And then you've got the opposite of that, which is abiotic noise, and that's the sound that is produced by things that are not living. So perhaps a waterfall or the sound of rain, the sound of thunder and lightning being produced, the sound of an earthquake, all these sorts of things that are produced by the earth or by weather and other things that are not living. And then the third category is kind of something that I see as straddling the two of these, and that's anthropogenic noise. And Anthropogenic sounds are ones that we produce in some way or another, and sometimes that's directly, so it's our voices or our movements through the habitat, but other times it's indirectly because we create lots of things that are quite noisy, so air conditioning units, for example, or car horns. And so we can produce both biotic and abiotic sounds, in a sense, and put these out there into the environment. And of course, some of those things are incredibly loud, and later on I'll talk about why that is important. But first I want to make the switch into uh, the kind of major theme of today, which is my favorite biotic sound, which is the sounds that birds make. And we also often think of birds as making singing sounds or calling sounds, but in fact, they make lots of different sounds, and those are the sorts of, of variations and subtleties that I want to discuss today, because I think there are lots of noises that birds make that people don't realize, or they, they've never heard examples of these before, and so I want to highlight some of those rarer ones and think about them um, next to some of the ones we know a bit more about, and think about why do we have this much variety, and what are these different things used for? But first off, why is it that birds make sounds at all? Well, there are lots of fundamental reasons why sounds are quite useful and important in a bird's life. The first of these is that sound allows them to show off, and this is particularly true when we're thinking of males, although it's not limited uh, exclusively to males. So it's quite important to be able to deliver a vocal performance that shows that you are capable of learning things that are very complicated and remembering them, and also are capable of then telling your body to produce that intricate sound and of maintain, maintaining the physiology and the morphology to be able to do that appropriately. So to show off, basically we're talking about sounds that are made during the breeding season, during the spring and summer in this area, when you've got birds that are sitting there singing their hearts away and trying to woo a mate and bring a mate onto the territory. But at the same time, those sounds can be used to indicate that a quality individual is ready to fight off any potential competitors that want to come take that territory or uh, try to take away a mate that is potentially interested in this individual. So there are also um, kind of vocal combats in a way, or at least vocal assessments, where individuals will sit there and listen to each other and decide whether or not it's worth pursuing a potential physical fight with 
uh, another bird. So you can tell by the intricacy and the quality of a bird's song whether or not that individual is likely to be strong enough and fit enough to put up much of a fight if you were to go challenge for some sort of resource. Other organisms also can be intimidated by the sound of a vocalization or any other sort of sound production. So often you'll have not just a conspecific rival, so a member of your own, um, your own species, but also a member of another species that is trying to attack you for some reason. Maybe it's a predator, for example, or maybe it's uh, a parasite. Who knows what's going on? But there are often enemies that will approach you in your habitat, and so if you have a loud, scary, or even misleading sound, maybe you sound like another organism altogether, you can use that sound in order to scare these things away and um, get rid of them. And actually, when I used to ring birds, when I was a, a, a I want to say bird bander, because that's the phrase we use in the U.S., when I was a field hand uh, at these research stations, we often would have birds that would sit there very quietly in our hand throughout most of the procedure, and then out of nowhere they would utter these incredibly loud noises. And it was just so startling, even though it didn't sound like a lion's roar, it was still scary because it just came out of the blue and it made you kind of jump and often you would loosen the grip on the bird and it would fly away. So actually it sounds like, you know, a voice can't possibly be that scary, but actually this is a very useful strategy if you want to take something by surprise and escape in the moment that it's kind of not paying as much attention. Birds often will also use sounds in order to ask for help, and sometimes that's a young bird that's trying to ask for food or ask for warmth or ask for some other kind of parental care. That might be a mate that wants help from its partner in raising its young in some way, or it might be a member of your family or your larger group in order to um, share information about where the food can be found or to kind of ask you to come over and help whenever there is um, maybe there's a big hawk in the area and you want to scare it off because it's dangerous for all of you collectively. So there are lots of situations in which birds would work together and they use their sounds in order to achieve that. Also, as I've talked about in the past on the show, a lot of animals are able to identify each other very specifically. So we know that one animal can tell not only whether something is its own species, but also whether it is kind of uh, from the general area, whether it's a member of its family, or even exactly which animal it is. They basically have vocal signatures in the same way that we have names, and so they can use their voices to identify themselves. And we often think of this relative to penguins, for example, because we know that penguins can make these really loud and crazy vocalizations in the middle of these massive colonies that are just full of millions of birds, and they're extremely loud, and yet the parents can cue in on the sounds of their young and identify not only which bird is their own offspring, but also where exactly it is, and they can navigate to it through that huge crowd. So it's quite useful to be able to I, identify uh, a specific bird. And of course, then you've also got sounds, and we, we tend to not think about this really, but sounds that are produced on accident. So often if you are just wandering through a park, you're wandering through the woods, and you hear something in the branches, you know, maybe something has landed a bit too hard, or it's snapped off a branch, or it's rustling through the leaves, and you turn your head and notice it, other animals can notice those sounds as well, for better or worse. So lots of species and lots of individuals might often make sounds on accident, uh, usually associated with movement of some sort. And those actually can be quite important sounds if you think about it, especially if these are sounds that can alert other organisms to a bird's presence. Now, as I've already alluded to, it's not just males that make sound, but also females, and this is particularly true in areas where the birds are living in territories year-round, and also where they mate for long periods of time. You often will have both members of a partnership making vocalizations and making noises in order to defend their area, and that's particularly true in areas where you live year-round because those are kind of hotly contested. You've got not that many spots for a lot of birds, and so they're always going to need to patrol their borders and maintain that area for themselves. You also have noises being made by both older birds and younger birds. Now, again, when we think of birds making noise, we tend to think of maybe the really young ones that are begging for food, or the fully mature ones that are uh, old enough to be out there singing, looking for a mate in the spring. But actually, there are a lot of birds 
in the middle there, kind of in the adolescent stage, if you like, that will also make noises. And this is for a variety of reasons. They might be kind of practicing their own sound. They might be kind of working on the development of their vocal cords and the musculature associated with it. They might be making sounds in order to then hear them and have kind of a bit of auditory feedback so that they can practice producing that sound and then listen to it so that they can mentally compare that to what they've listened to from a song tutor, so maybe from their father or from a neighbor that they've heard singing previously. And they can then uh, kind of detect whether there are differences there and adjustments that they need to make so they can then fix that and make their song a bit better uh, in, in the future. So you have actually vocalizations being made throughout the animals' lives. And sometimes they'll sit just before the breeding season, even the mature birds, the older ones, and they'll kind of sit there and hone their song a bit. So they, they might be a bit rusty from having migrated over the winter, not really sung a whole lot. So they'll come back and just before the breeding season, they'll kind of mumble to themselves a bit as they practice what it is they're supposed to be singing to woo a mate or to defend the territory. So throughout their lives, they do a variety of different vocalizations for different reasons, and, and they do have to brush up sometimes, just like we do if it's been a while since we've practiced an instrument. And finally, the other thing to point out is that often when we think about uh, birds making noises, we think of songbirds, which are you know the little birds that are singing, um, perched up in the tree canopy, maybe sitting at your bird feeder in your back garden. But actually it's birds of all sizes that make vocalizations and that use vocalizations quite a lot in their lives. So even things like penguins, as I said earlier, cranes, uh, quite large birds like ostriches, all of these things do have vocalizations and use them for various purposes. And just because we don't see it happen a whole lot doesn't mean that it, um, that it doesn't happen at all or that it's not quite important when it does. So now on that note, I think I'll take a break for a minute so you can have another type of sound to listen to other than just my voice. I'll play you a bit of music and then come back and launch into my top 10 list of interesting bird sounds. Welcome back to the Wild Side. That was The Sound of White by Missy Higgins, and this is your host, Caitlin Kite. And today I am talking about bird sounds, and I have, just before the break, given a little bit of background about what sound is and which birds make sounds and why sounds are important. And now I want to launch into my top 10 list of the most interesting and unusual sounds that are made by birds. Now it's probably not surprising to anyone that the number one thing on my list is singing, which I have been referring to throughout the first 30 minutes of the show. Now songs are defined as long, complex vocalizations that are used mostly during the breeding season. And often it's hard to uh, draw the line between songs and calls, which are uh, the number two vocalization on my list. And that's because we have these kind of groups of birds that we call passerines and non-passerines. And passerines tend to be also known as songbirds, and non-passerines are song birds that might produce noises, but they're not singing birds. So things like crows, for example, or jackdaws. Now, when you listen to a crow or a jackdaw, make a vocalization. That really doesn't sound anything like, uh, for example, a robin, because it's not nearly as melodious or harmonic or basically as musical as th the songs of the little birds sound. However, there are some species that are kind of in the middle, and it's quite hard to distinguish. And so you can have kind of an argument, a bit of a, a toss-up, about whether something's actually a song or whether it's a call. But basically, a song is a vocalization that's being used to attract a potential partner and to repel uh, a potential competitor that wants either your mate or your territory or some other resource. And so these tend to be vocalizations that are used during the breeding season and really not much uh, at much other time, although we do sometimes have birds that are territorial year-round, and so they will use their songs also in the winter and in the autumn. But again, the reason they do that is because they're territorial, and territoriality is kind of connected to the breeding season, because that's the space where in the following spring they plan to have their nest and attract a mate. So as long as the song is kind of delivered in this context, that is a useful word to use to refer to these sorts of vocalizations. And as I mentioned earlier, they are generally produced by males, although sometimes you have females um, getting involved as well, and that's actually a completely different type of vocalization that I'll mention a bit later in my countdown. 
And because songs are associated with breeding activities, they tend to be produced in this area of the world in the spring and summer. And so we're kind of reaching the point of the year where we're tapering off on the song uh, performances, and we're going to start hearing a lot more calling as birds are thinking about moving out of this area, migrating elsewhere. We might get them kind of shifting across the landscape as they look for different food resources, as the plants and the insects that they were relying on earlier are no longer uh, in bloom or in residence. So this is the type of year, time of year when things start to change a little bit and we see the vocalizations moving from singing into calling. Now I have an interesting vocalization that I want to play for you here. This is from one of my favorite songbird species, the Viri, which is from North America. And it is uh, a member of the thrush family, so it is related to some birds that you know and love here. And uh, this bird is really interesting because it can sing with both uh, a left voice and a right voice. And, you know, humans have a left and right part of their vocal cords, but we can't really activate both of them simultaneously. There are a few Buddhist monks that are able to do this. Tori Amos went uh, to learn from them and reportedly figured out how to do this as well. But it's a very jarring sound. It's quite uncomfortable for us to hear, and I think that probably is because we don't generally produce this ourselves. But in birds, it can sound really lovely, and it makes the, sound, uh, the songs quite intricate and complicated. So that was the song of the Viri, and if you get to see these uh, on paper, and I'll put a version of uh, a visualization of this up on the Source FM website, you can see the two different voices, and we can create something called a sonogram, where you can look at the change in frequency of the notes as they're delivered over time. And for each of these, you can see for each note, you've got both the left voice and the right voice, and one of them is slightly higher than the other, so it creates this harmonic effect, which is why the voice sounds so pleasant to us. Now the next type of vocalization on my list is calling, and actually I have uh, the call of the Viri as well, and you can contrast how much simpler um, the call is than the song, and really get an idea of why it is that we have two different words to distinguish these two different types of vocalizations. So the Viri was the one that was calling right at the front of that recording. I know that there are some other noises in the background of other birds that were singing in the forest. And it's the one that goes, Vir, Vir. And that's actually the reason that it was given the name that it was given. People thought that it sounded as though it was saying the word Vir. And so that's why it's called the Viri. So of course, songs, as you can tell from this, are quite simple. They tend to, they tend to be very short, and they're used year-round for a variety of purposes. And actually, it's calling that is responsible for lots of those um, uses that I was discussing before the break, where I was saying that we have vocalizations that are used to provide information and to alarm predators, maybe to get help from other individuals. Those are all things that calls tend to be used for rather than other types of noises. And most, if not all, birds are able to produce calls and do produce calls. And actually, a lot of these things are innate, which means that the birds are born knowing how to produce them and also knowing when is an appropriate time to produce them. And that is because calls are extremely fundamental to living. A bird that can't uh, call out when it sees a predator is a bird that's not going to last very long and whose relatives are not going to last very long because it's not going to be able to spare them from being attacked. So being able to communicate with a call is quite important for the longevity of both an individual uh, and a population and also the whole species. And that's why these are ingrained sorts of responses that these birds are able to produce basically from the very beginning and also to interpret. So for example, if a chick in a nest hears its parent uh, utter an alarm call, it immediately will crouch down and be very quiet and still. So these are things that basically require very, very little learning whatsoever and they can just launch right into being able to use these sorts of sounds. Now the next thing on my list is one of the first that maybe you haven't thought of too much in association with birds, and that is hissing. And hissing is something that we're familiar with in other species like snakes and cats and maybe even cockroaches if you know a little bit about bugs. But it's also used by birds. And those of you that have taken a walk around Swan Pool might have heard this uh, over the last couple of months because hissing is often used to indicate fear and anger. And although we tend to think of it 
as being used by swans and geese and other large birds, it's actually used by birds of all different sizes. So uh, vultures in North America are known to hiss. Things like cockatiels, which are relatively small, those will hiss also. Even something as small as a tit, a blue tit, if you disturb a female on her nest, she might hiss at you in order to try to frighten you off. And barn owls, uh, often their vocalizations are described as a hiss. But actually, I think that's kind of an interesting point because most of the time, hissing is produced by um, breathing out air in a very uh, rapid and kind of muscular way. So you're expelling air really rapidly, and it makes kind of a whooshing sound. And if you get your tongue involved, it makes a bit of a s sound. But then you've also got a similar noise that's described as hissing that actually involves the vocal cords and is a bit more of a screechy sort of sound. And that's what you've got when you've got the barn owl. So actually this one term kind of encompasses lots of different types of vocalizations. But basically, what I find quite interesting about this type of noise is that it is found throughout the animal kingdom and it's used over and over for the very same purpose. And so that means that all of us actually are very uh, easily able to interpret what this means. From the moment that you're quite a small child, you will respond to a hissing noise with a bit of a, a pause and maybe a little bit of fear as well. And you actually do see that throughout the animal kingdom, that a lot of animals use this same noise, so we've all maybe kind of converged on this same sort uh, of vocalization. And we also are all able to interpret it rather rapidly, which means that there isn't a long education period. We can kind of uh, respond immediately, which is quite useful for communication. Now, I think we've all heard what a hiss sounds like, but I'll go ahead and play you a bit of a clip here just so you have an example of one. So that was the sound of a barnyard goose hissing as it defends its young and its mate against the potential threat. And the next number on my list, number four, is booming. And I wish I could play you a recording of this as well, but unfortunately it doesn't translate very well across the airways because booms tend to be quite low pitch. And so this is really good when you're out in the habitat and you need to get your noise uh, across quite a big expansive area because low pitched noises tend to transmit really well. Those long wavelengths are quite powerful and so they can last for a really long distance. But over the airwaves, when you guys are driving along in your cars or sitting at your desk, there tend to be lots of other noises that kind of obscure those. But uh, I think you probably all have been around a wetland at some point, and maybe you've been lucky enough to hear a bittern as it booms during the summertime. And of course, bitterns aren't really doing all that well. Their populations have fallen throughout Europe recently, but they are making a comeback in lots of places. So maybe you have had a chance to hear this song. Uh, sorry, this sound. Other birds that boom include things like prairie chicken and grouse in the U.S. in particular, uh, and birds like the kakapo in New Zealand. And these are animals that all need to get their voices across big expansive areas. So the grouse and the prairie chicken, for example, they live in these quite open, windy habitats, and they need to produce quite um, a big vocalization that females can hear from a really long distance off and come in in order to see the males displaying. In the case of bitterns and also cockapos, they're in habitats where they're quite hard to see, in addition to potentially being um, quite far away from where uh, potential mates are. And so they need to produce a sound that allows those potential mates to triangulate their position and find them despite all of the reeds or the trees or whatever else is in the way. And so they produce these really percussive sounds that kind of sound like drum beats basically. And it takes a lot of energy to produce these sorts of sounds and that's because the birds need to draw in so much air and then push it back out again with their muscles. So it's the type of vocalization that you can really use to figure out how high quality an individual is. How many of these can it make? How loud are they? How deep are they? And that, um, if you start to make a list of all those little characteristics, you as a potential choosy female or maybe a rival can figure out if this is an individual worth engaging in some way or another. Now earlier on in the show I talked about um, the fact that there are kind of learning periods in birds and I was talking about how we can kind of learn to understand what a sound means and, and put all those different characteristics together to figure out whether a sound is a voice or an animal and so on. However, there are some birds that are quite capable of reproducing sounds and figuring out the frequency, amplitude, and timing characteristics of lots of different sounds and memorizing those and replicating them really well. So things like mockingbirds in the U.S. or 
Well, actually, blackbirds and starlings here in the UK are lyrebirds over in uh, the Asian region. So there are lots of animals that are able to mimic, and this is also known as copycatting. And basically, they're just reproducing the noises that are made by animals or objects or processes or whatever else it is that's in their habitat. And I have a couple of recordings here to play for you. The first is of a northern mockingbird that's performing in the U.S. And you can hear it go from one song to another, and there are lots of different birds that it is mimicking. And these include the northern cardinal, uh, the blue-gray gnatcatcher, the Carolina wren, and the blue jay, among others. So that was the northern mockingbird, and now I'm going to move on to an animal that's a bit closer to home, and that is the blackbird. And this recording is quite interesting because it shows how these birds are capable of picking up anthropogenic noises. And if you've ever watched David Attenborough on TV, then you probably have seen the clip in which he plays uh, the lyrebird song. And this lyrebird has learned sounds like chainsaws and car alarms and all sorts of things, photographs being taken. Well, this is a similar sort of thing, but it's happened here in the UK. And this is a blackbird that has learned the sound of a phone ringing, and it has incorporated that sound into its own song. And what's kind of interesting about that is that it doesn't just reproduce the sound of the phone, it also adds its own little twist on the end. So after each ring, you can almost, you can hear it kind of add in its own little twist as well, and its own little bit of personality. So that, again, if you're just joining us, was the sound of a blackbird that has learned to incorporate within its song the sound of a mobile phone ringing, and then it's added its own little bit of a twist on the end of it to make it its own performance and its own distinct uh, kind of vocal display. Now what's interesting about mimics is that they have lots of different methods of reproducing sounds. Sometimes they do lots of different sounds, they just move from one to the other, like the mockingbird example that I showed you, and they kind of don't repeat. But then you've got others that will repeat a similar sound over and over and over again and then move on to the next sound in the list. And you've got others that will do A, B, C, D and then go back A, B, C, D and do that a few times before then moving on all together. So even though they are repeating the same sounds over and over that they've got kind of stored away in their memory banks, they can do that in lots of different ways. And it all depends on what other members of that species are reacting to. Uh, and often it's the females that are interested in the males and have certain preferences, therefore, uh, that are what drive how these birds decide to perform. So if the females tend to pref prefer a lot of immediate variation, then you might have the bird going um, from one song to the other without ever repeating for days. Or if the females want to be able to evaluate a performance uh, over and over again, then you might have kind of an ABC, ABC, ABC performance so they can hear how much variation is there from one performance to the other. Is he flagging or is he able to do that same thing again and again and again? And so it's that female choice that's driving the way these guys decide to uh, reproduce the sounds that they're hearing in their habitats. Now again, females feature in this next number on my list, which is number six, and that is the, the performance of duetting. And duetting, as you know from uh, human music, is when you've got a couple of performers working together to produce a coordinated vocalization. And what's really amazing about uh, avian duetters <laughs> is that they are actually thinking alike, regardless of whether they're singing or listening to their partner sing. So researchers have performed brain scans on these guys, and they can actually see that there are very similar neurological patterns, regardless of whether you're performing or listening, because basically they're having to go through the performance in their head in order to know exactly when it is that they're supposed to chime in and start taking over the melody on their own. It's a really amazing, intricate thing. and. Um, you tend to see this quite often in areas where you've got birds that are breeding throughout the year, so in tropical habitats, or where you've got animals that have to maintain a territory year-round. So things like wrens, uh, northern cardinals in the U.S., these animals will tend to do this quite often. And it's a really amazing experience. I, I once was sitting near a cardinal nest, and I was in between the male and the female as one started performing and the other would answer. And if I hadn't had one on each side, I would never have known that they were two different birds. It was just a seamless performance where the moment one stopped, the other started up again, and it just sounded like a single voice. So it's really amazing what these guys are capable of and how they seem to be able to 
uh, learn to do this quite quickly. And actually, performing these duets together, this sounds very romantic, it actually helps uh, cement what we refer to as a pair bond, which is how close uh, the two members are to each other and how likely or not they are to kind of cheat on each other with another animal. Uh, well, specifically, another uh, potential mate. So the more pair bonded they are, the less likely they are to find another partner. So singing is bringing them together in a sense. Now number seven on my list is something that's not a vocalization at all, so it's a bit of a departure from these other noises, but it's used very much the same way that songs are used. And this is drumming. And drumming, of course, is not made by a whole lot of different bird species, but it is performed by woodpeckers. And woodpeckers use their really sturdy bills to uh, bang against wood and also to bang against whatever else they can find. As many of you know, if you've ever had them wake you up early in the morning drumming on um, your eaves or your drain pipes or some other metal structure on your house. So they do this in order to uh, advertise in the same way that a singing bird would, that it wants a potential female to come in and mate with it during the breeding season, or it wants rival males to stay out. And because they want to get that sound to resonate and to echo through the habitat, they will often deliberately choose these anthropogenic materials that can be much louder uh, and more reverberative than some of the structures they might find out in nature. And I've got an example of some woodpecker drumming right here. Now what you'll notice from listening to that is that uh, different species of woodpecker have very distinct types of drumming patterns. So there were three different species there and you could tell that they got, um, there was an increase in rapidity from the first to the second and then there was a bit of a, a slowdown but also a, a change up of the pace between number two and number three. So whereas the first couple were quite um, steady, the third one had a bit of variety in its rhythm. And the birds use this to tell whether or not something is uh, of the same species and therefore whether they need to respond to it or not because most of the time they really only care about members of their own species. They don't feel the need to compete or run off uh, members from other species and of course they don't want to mate with them either. So they're able to use these drumming sounds to tell whether a bird is uh, an animal that they want to respond to in some way or not. Now number eight on my list is something you'll undoubtedly have heard but maybe not really thought about in too much detail and that is flight vocalizations. And these are vocalizations, as you might expect, that are produced while the birds are in air which they tend to do because they want to broadcast their sounds over a larger distance. But there are actually multiple reasons why a bird might find itself in the position of doing a flight vocalization. So you've got some species like swifts that are pretty much always on the wing. And so they never really have a chance to perch and produce a song performance. So of course these guys are going to end up vocalizing while they're in flight. Then you've got other species that, uh, like the goldfinch, are often around conspecifics and they want to go somewhere together and coordinate a movement. And so they tend to cheep a lot as they're flying in order to stay in touch and make sure they're all going the same direction, they're all going to the same destination. And so they use these vocalizations to kind of coordinate that group effort. And then the third one, uh, and maybe there are other categories as well, but these are the three big ones that I thought of, is when you've got birds that need to do kind of a big vocal performance and uh, physical performance as well, and so they integrate the two. And these are things like woodcock and snipe uh, and pipits, where they will go up into the air and then fly around in a really intricate pattern and make vocalizations while they do this. And the vocalizations draw attention to them so that other animals will see this performance, but also they kind of enhance the performance by showing that the bird can do multiple things at any given time. So uh, the rock pipit probably is the best example of one that happens around here, and I've seen this quite a lot as I've been walking along the coast, uh, especially on the Isles of Scilly when we go there with our students during the spring sometimes. And you can see these guys going up and doing their kind of fluttering, bombing sort of flight and tweeting all the while. Now number nine on my list is another thing that you definitely have heard, and that is begging. And begging sounds are produced predominantly by chicks, and at this time of year you've probably been sick to death of listening to galls begging, so I won't play you that sound clip, which I do have here. 
Um, but you know, the gull begging sound is actually quite a, a good example because it, it shows you exactly what sorts of characteristics a good begging sound has. And that is, it's loud, it's repetitive, uh, it's quite hard to tune out because it has uh, both high pitch and low pitch components and so it's, it's broadband and that means that you know, we tend to, it just impinges on our brains and it's quite hard for us to shut that out. It's quite hard for the parent birds to shut that out as well. But the thing that I want to point out is that it's not just baby birds that will do this, but also adults. And this is particularly true of females. And there are a lot of cases where you've got female birds that will beg or kind of faux beg to the males in order to get some sort of help. So often you will have a female that is breeding and she's sitting on the nest incubating eggs and she wants the male to bring her some food in order to help sustain her. Or maybe during uh, the kind of courtship scenario, she will want a male to give her a little something to show that he is worth mating with and so he'll bring her a gift and you will find females kind of make a begging noise at this time and like the chicks they'll also assume a begging posture so begging vocalizations are quite important and they're found not just in the young but also in adults as well and not just in the case of wanting food but also any type of care uh, for example warmth or maybe defense from a predator or removing a parasite or whatever it is that an animal is in need of. Now in the last couple minutes of the show I want to quickly talk about number 10 on my list and that is incidental sounds. And incidental sounds are really interesting because they're the ones that are not produced intentionally for the purposes of communication but they're completely accidental and often they are related to movement. So hummingbirds, for example, make a buzzing sound as they fly simply because their wings happen to move that fast. Morning doves, whenever they take off in flight, their wings produce a whistling sound because of the air that's being forced through the feathers. Then you've got things like snowy owls that might clack their beaks a little bit whenever they are approached by any animal that they find threatening. And so they do this beak clacking to indicate that they're unhappy and to scare an animal off. And actually, I have a recording of that being produced, actually not by an owl, but by ravens. So that was the sound of ravens... Raven, blah, blah, blah. <coughs> so that was the sound of ravens snapping their bills at each other, which they do in social settings in order to indicate dominance and assert themselves. Now I should mention that this list that I have, my top 10, is not at all exclusive. There are lots of other vocalizations that birds make as well, but these are some of the top 10 uh, that are really common and quite important and I thought would be kind of a good introduction into the world of avian sound making and vocalizations. And I should also mention that humans make a lot of noise that can uh, cover up these bird sounds. So it's quite good for us to try to be quiet as much as we can so that the birds can communicate with each other effectively. And this is quite important for their survival. And it's also really nice for us because it can allow us to learn a lot about them and what they're doing out in the habitat. And hopefully now that you've heard this list, you can keep your ears open next time you're out and listen to a whole new world that maybe you didn't know was out there. <laughs>